Um, hopefully you got the file that Bryce sent out this morning uh, that is just a summary about all of the new things that are in 7.4. So what I'm going to do is go down through there, um, at least for the most part, and point out some of those things. And then uh, towards the end, I'll just recap some things, uh, some highlights from 7.3 to make sure that everybody knows those, uh, because I know not everybody's even up to 7.3 yet. So we'll, uh, we'll start by that. So like I said, I'm just going to go down through this handout that we have. Uh, the first thing that it's discussing is just general overview, uh, generic benefits like performance benefits and um, analytics and things like that. Um, and the first specific thing that it mentions is the mass intelligence product, which is basically a replacement for FRX. So for anybody that's using FRX, uh, the official support for that product is going to end at the end of 2012. Uh, that doesn't mean that you can't use it anymore. It just means that uh, you know Sage isn't going to support any questions on it or anything like that. So they've come up with this tool called Mass Intelligence, which is their replacement for it. So the next thing that's pointed out here is the uh, the Business Insights Explorer. So there's a couple of things on here that uh, that might be useful. And I'll go into one of the explorers and, um, and show you. So I'm just going to pull up the uh, the AR Invoice Explorer, and we can look at some of the features just using that as an example. All right, so it's getting loaded up here. OK, so uh, we've got our normal Explorer view in here, at least as it's looked like for the last couple of versions. Um, one big problem with the Explorer was exporting data out uh, in a usable format. If you just right click on in here and click Export, or if you uh, go up here to the Export button, then in the past, all it would do, it would export everything out here in addition to any of the fields that you may not have had checked to view here. Well, they've added, they fixed that problem and added a feature to where you can export to Excel uh, just the data in the grid, which is what you see, which is usually what you're going to want, or you can choose all data. And that would be all data in the SQL view, regardless of if you've chosen to see it or not. And if you don't know what I mean by that, you can select which columns you want to see in the Explorer by selecting, selecting the Edit Columns button. So all of the ones checked we're seeing. All of these down here that aren't, we're not seeing. So in the past, when you try to export it, it would bring out even all of this stuff, whether you want it or not. Now you've got the ability to choose uh, which set of data you want to bring out. Okay. They mentioned a couple of other explorers uh, that they have uh, that they've added in there regarding units of measure and landed cost transactions. Uh, so those are, you know, those are nice features to add if you use, you know, if you're intensive in that part of your business. Um, another thing that you can add, uh, I know a lot of times if you've got a lot of data, this this load, this data load can be slow. Uh, so they have put in the ability uh, for you to constrain how many records come out of here. Um, so in this case, unless you filter it out, it's going to show everybody. You can also go into uh, the system manager, the business insights view, and uh, select only how many records you want to see. So maybe the top. Uh, top 100 or something like that. The problem with that is, is that if you set that setting in here, then it stays that way until you undo it. So if I run the, uh, the Customer Explorer, I'll go down there and do that, and I'll show you what the difference looks like when it comes up. You 
Okay, so now I've got this set to only show my top 20 customers. Well, it's going to pull them up in, um, let's see, just pulled up the top 20 from the query, and it shows down here that there's only 20 rows, and it shows this constraint is on there. Uh, you can't get that constraint off unless you go back into the system and change that. Um, you'll notice here on the uh, Invoice Explorer, it's not there. So it's a feature they added. I'm not sure how useful it's going to be to people, uh, but it's, you know, it's something that's there. The next topic uh, is the uh, e-business suite. Depending on how long you've been on Mass 500, you may remember the uh, e-sales order module or e-customer module or some of those quote unquote e-modules that they've had in the past that allowed you to do things uh, via the web. That has been replaced by this specific application that was created by a, another reseller. And what it does is it gives you uh, some and actually a large bit of functionality uh, from Mass 500 on the web. So you can install this and go in and do things like inquiries, create invoices, create sales orders, all of that type of thing. It just gives you a web interface for Mass 500. It's, uh, it's actually pretty neat. We've, we've seen it a few times and it, uh, it looks good. The next things that are discussed are around uh, accounts receivable and payments. Uh, so I'm going to go in here into a customer, and, and we'll look at some information that um, that I put in earlier. Uh, but the two main things are, one is that you can overpay invoices. Uh, in the past, if you uh, created a payment and uh, you couldn't actually over-apply the invoice, you just you pay it, and if you wanted to apply more of it, uh, you can leave it as an open cash receipt or create a credit memo against the account. In this case, you can now, after some requests, um, people actually want to be able to track that an invoice has been overpaid uh, as opposed to just having a cash payment sitting out there. I've only run into one client that this is useful for, uh, but you know, I'm sure there's others out there since they just had the request to do that. So I'll, I'll look at an example I created earlier. I'm going to go into uh, customer status. Look at the ledger. And so we'll see I created this payment down here at the bottom for $10,000, applied it to an invoice of uh, like $4,800, and then it shows me the the open balance on the cash receipt. And if you look at the payables report, it'll show them matched up. Uh, but it just gives you a little bit different way to, to track cash receipts and their applications. A more useful one that I find in, uh, in AR, I think that almost everybody's going to like, and that's the ability to process customer refunds from within AR as opposed to going into AP. In the past, you've had to go into AP and create some kind of dummy vendor or write a manual check or, or whatever else. And now, you can just go into cash receipts in here. You've got several different types of refunds you can choose from. You can do a refund check, a refund credit card if you're using the credit card module, and then a refund other. So the refund check is really simple. You just put in the customer. You put in a refund. Uh, uh, payment reference, which would typically be the check number, and then put in an amount. You can apply it to any specific transactions if you like, or you don't have to. Um, so in this case, I'm done. I've got a $400 refund check there, and then I can go in and print the refund check right from here. So that's a really nice feature. Uh, obviously, that needs some security around it because you don't want people just writing checks, uh, but it's got security features um, to where a user can get into the batch and do their normal cash receipts but not print uh, refund checks. 
So I think it's got all the appropriate security around it as well. But it's just a nice feature, and uh, some businesses is really going to save a lot of time. Next, uh, the next section discusses sales order improvements. Uh, this is another big one that we get requests for all the time, and that's the ability to put in negative sales order lines. This doesn't affect uh, inventory items, but it does affect non-inventory items. So if you want to add, you know, refund on there or credit or discount or whatever you might want to put on there, you can now put that onto the sales order. So I can now put on a negative amount, whereas I couldn't easily do that in the past, and it will also flow forward to the invoice itself. Uh, seemingly simple change will be, be really nice for, uh, for a lot of people. Uh, the next set of things, uh, I'm looking on, let's see, I'm looking on page four of the document. Uh, the second half of the page is around the replenishment module. In the past, you've had the ability to, uh, to do replenishment and select a preferred vendor, but it was at, it was at a level that wasn't, uh, convenient for a lot of people. So now they've changed this up and added more flexibility to where you can uh, set preferred vendors and things like that more easily when you're using replenishment. So in the past, uh, if you had a purchase product line tied to this item in this warehouse, it would automatically use the vendor set up in that warehouse replenishment. Well, now you can continue to do that or you can override it. In the past, that just caused problems uh, with not being able to override it because, you know, people always have one-off conditions and they always want to be able to make that change. So this is, a, this is a nice change as well. Some other things they've done are regarding unit of measure changes. Uh, there have been some errors in the past in the unit measure conversions, depending on how you use them and how uh, what your what your exact conversions are, so they've really worked to fix that up, make the unit of measure conversion work better. Uh, there's also an explorer that they've added in here to give you a uh, to give you more visibility about the unit of measures that you've assigned to specific items. Again, this may or may not be beneficial to you in your in your industry, but um, certainly def people will find that it is you know that it is a big benefit. So I'm looking at this explorer to see the different items, uh, the different units of measures, conversion factors. I can easily see where that that unit of measure is being used and things like that. The last big change in inventory is the setup to the landed costs. In the past in MAPS 500, landed costs have basically just been estimates. So you could say, I'm going to order this item and I expect my freight to be about 10% of that or I expect my tax to be 10% of that or whatever the case may be. And you could put in an estimate and state that. And then when you received it, it would tack that amount on to the received cost and adjust your, your inventory uh, cost either for that item or that cost here or whatever the case may be in your environment. Well, now they've, they've changed that to add more flexibility to it um, around any of the specific landing costs you define. You can define whether to apply it to a specific item 
to a specific vendor. And then also they have allowed you to adjust it at the time of the PO receipt to make it an actual and not just an estimate, which is uh, I think a lot of people are like because you, you know you bring in you bring in items into your warehouse. You want to make sure that the cost is correct, and you want to tack on whatever you want to tack on with it not being the estimate. So now this is a big change that's going to allow people to, to do that. I won't go into the actual, well, I'll quickly go into to how it works in the process receipt of goods. So in here, I've already created a receipt. I've got a specific PO and a specific line that I'm receiving. I can go to this landing cost button. And you can see here that I can, uh, I can choose which landed cost items I want to use. And the reason that you have a uh, set up for the landing cost is that it's got GL accounts and other defaults associated with it. So it's got a, a type of cost. And then I can choose whether to apply it down here um, to an item or to whatever I want to apply it to. And then I can choose either the default amount, which in this case is $10, or I can override it if I know a better actual amount and allow it to post that to the cost of the item. So that made it uh, you know, pretty simple to do. Whereas in the past, you couldn't do it at all. So that's a nice feature. Moving on to, uh, to page six of that guide, the unit of measure conversions I touched on earlier. Again, they've just really made the system more efficient and a little bit more flexible and corrected some errors that could occur uh, when, when converting between units of measure either in purchasing, stocking, or uh, sales and shipment. And the technology enhancement, it's always really important because we find people that will upgrade either MAS 500 or upgrade their internal operating systems and versions of Windows and things like that before, before carefully considering this. So just note here that in going to uh, 7.4, MAS 500 supports Windows Office 2010, and uh, the other big one is uh, Microsoft SQL Server 2008 R2. Uh, so, if you, so you can warn your IT staff about that. Um, there's a new version of Crystal, which for most people isn't uh, a terribly big deal, and that's that's really only going to affect you if anybody within your organization does any. Uh, of the crystal report design. It won't affect how the, the reports themselves run. So those are the main things from 7.4. Um, just to touch on some things from 7.3, uh, if, if you're not on that or maybe, you're not a, maybe you are on it and you're not aware of it, uh, they added in their own credit card processing functionality in 7.4. Uh, they improved the physical count functionality to make that a little bit easier uh, and more flexible when you're putting in counts. They put in the ability, uh, again, from the technical side, to support 64-bit uh, operating systems, which hasn't always been there. That causes a lot of problems, uh, at least coming from our end. Uh, it supports SQL 2008, whereas prior versions only went up through SQL Server 2005. Um, and then some of the functional changes in there uh, that I think flow pretty well to most people that use the system because they're in some of the basic modules, but they added in ACH and positive pay functionality straight out of the box, which were add-ons previously. Uh, they added the ability to choose uh, PDF as your medium for your document transmittal. In the past, it had to be a, an RTF or a uh, just a document format, and so many people wanted to send document transmittal with a PDF, so it was in a format that couldn't be modified. Uh, they finally added that. Uh, and then there's a, a few really nice enhancements on being able to merge things. So you can merge multiple customers into one. Uh, same thing with vendors and same thing with invoices. 
that's nice from the customer and vendor standpoint because a lot of times people will create things um, and either they are, you know, they've merged, actually merged with another customer or they were created inadvertently or they're a duplicate of somebody else. And so this allows you to consolidate data without losing, losing the history. So I think those are nice features as well. Uh, and then the invoice merge itself has to do with merging invoices created from different shipments. So if you've got 10 different invoices from 10 different shipments, but you really only want to send the customer one invoice, you can use that invoice merge function to do that. So I think Sage has actually put in quite a few useful benefits in, uh, in 7.3 and 7.4. They haven't always done that in my eyes. Um, but these last few releases have, uh, have really brought some good value to people that are that are staying on plan and, and upgrading. 